Yeah. Can't you be a daddy? Oh, well, I'm a daddy, all right. I, <laughs> I got five kids. A living daddy. Five. Yeah, yeah. Okay, take care. Okay. Chris, as a, as a songwriter and a lyricist, who do you count among your major influences? Mm. Well, Hank Williams, of course, was a... I guess he influenced me as much as an uh, as a writer and as a performing artist, uh, since he performed with so much emotion and so much soul. Um, of course, Bob Dylan. Uh, I'd been writing songs a long time before before I ever heard of Bob Dylan, but but Dylan opened up all the new doors for. Uh, for a different kind of songwriting than than what was going on in the 50s, you know, and in the early 60s, all of a sudden you could you could uh, write like a poet, you know, and you could have have strange imagery that uh, personal private imagery that wasn't usually found in in the old old songs by the Clovers and the Coasters and. You know the Lieber and Stoller song. I'd say Lieber and Stoller were also an influence, though, because uh, we grew up on those songs. You know, all the coasters hits, searching, and all those things. But uh, Buddy Holly, you know, I would I would say the two biggest would have been uh, of 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 established songwriters would have been Hank Williams and Bob Dylan, and then it'd be people that I I got to meet. Along the way, uh, I Willie Nelson was a hero long before I ever met him. You know, and Johnny Cash. Uh, I think "Big River" that Johnny Cash wrote is one of the one of the best rock and roll songs I ever heard. And uh, uh, Mickey Newberry. Uh, I think Mickey influenced my writing. He's another Texas writer uh, more than more than uh, any contemporary writer that I got to know. After that, it's people, I guess, like John Prine. But by that time, I had pretty much uh, established my direction and, my, and uh, the way I was saying things. When you first met Bob Dylan and, and you first became aware of his songs, did you have any idea then what an impact he was going to have on, on music and, and on America's way of looking at things? Uh, yeah, because he already had. Um, the first time I become aware of him, I think I was reading about him, uh, reading about him in relation to songs that he'd written for, for Peter, Paul, and Mary or something. Uh, Blowing in the wind, you know, and and uh, don't think twice. It's all right, and those things. And uh, and I guess at that time I didn't know how big he was going to be. But 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 immediately after, when I saw God, there's another lunatic out there. <laughs> you know, it was like uh, uh, Roger Miller was another uh, who who was who, who was a kindred spirit, sort of making a living at it. Um, but Bob Dylan continued to inspire throughout the, say, the five years that I was, I was going to school there in Nashville when I was just paying my dues, more or less, uh, and, and trying to figure out how to do what it was I wanted to do. Bob Dylan was a man that continually, every record was, was a, we waited for it, you know, to come out and find out how he was doing it now. And uh, he was, he was uh, a bigger influence than than anybody than the Beatles, uh, and since he was a songwriter, he was a bigger influence to me than Elvis. You know, it was, uh, it'll never be the same again. I think you're absolutely right when you said it earlier that that he was a poet. Uh huh. You know, and, and is. And know, is. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And is. You just mentioned someone else. A few minutes ago, and that was Hank Williams being a big influence. And can you comment at all on how it seems to me like Hank Williams really helped bridge the gap 
between country music and early rock and roll in the 40s mm -hmm. and 50s? Do you think so? Well, I think uh, um, part of that happened uh, when Ray Charles recorded Hank Williams songs. Uh, prior to that, the only people who had who had cut uh, Hank Williams songs to me hadn't done them justice. They were they were pop singers, like uh, good pop singers, like Tony Bennett and people like that. But it wasn't the same raw emotion. Uh, it was more like uh, a white man singing. Uh, Little Richard songs or Jimmy Reed or something. It it didn't work until, uh, till like Ray Charles cut Hank Williams songs and Elvis Presley sung, sung uh, Little Richard songs and both of them were able to, to pull the emotion of, that the song had out of it. Uh, Hank Williams, probably today would be accepted. In in uh, you know in all markets in in those days he was too strong for for uh, the popular taste while he was still alive I know that uh, I was in, living in California by that time and and uh, you you didn't leave your windows down on your car when you were listening to Hank Williams songs you know because because it wasn't cool in but I loved him oh I do yeah. too. I do too. In the 70s, you were one of the, the first artists to sort of cross over between country and rock. Do you think that there are strong grassroots uh, connections between, between both uh, genres? Well, I think, I think uh, in, a, in the pure form, uh, country music is uh, white man's soul music. It's like, it's like the, the the blues or or uh, R and B, um, it's about real things, and it's there's very little uh, BS. It's like uh, it's more like Hemingway's writing than uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and emotional, and that's what appeals to me about it. You know, and I think that's why why it uh, works for rock and roll too. You know, uh, today. To me, the uh, the boundaries are a lot more artificial today than uh, because there's, it's hard for me to tell the difference. I'll, when I turn on the radio, it takes me a while to tell whether I'm listening to a pop station or a rock station or a country station. Uh, it depends on who's who's singing the song, but the the people who are true to their school like Joe Ely and, and Willie Nelson and stuff like that, cross a lot of boundaries. Yeah. And uh, I feel like our music does too, me and my band, you know. The only difference is we're not in any of the bins in the music <laughs> store. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a real problem being placed anywhere now. And that's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think that, that country music um, more reflects what's going on in America than rock and roll music is, is a general rule? Uh, I think that'd be a bit of a, I, I wouldn't want to put, put, you know, say, agree with that right off, off the top of my head because, uh, because um, immediately I started thinking of Bob Dylan and, and thinking uh, that nobody reflect more of what's happening in America than Bob, and whether it was his country influence, like Woody Guthrie, or whatever it was, uh, to me, he was the heaviest social commentator that we had. And, uh, and uh, I, right now I'm thinking of Bruce Springsteen, who also has country influences, but is a rocker, you know, and he's, but he's telling what's happening in America. And Jackson Brown uh, is has a great new album out that's it's full of stuff about Nicaragua, and uh, and that means what's happening in America, you know. Uh, and these are all rockers, so I I have a hard time saying that country was more about what's happening. I think it's I like to say I'd like to think it's equally as interested in what's happening, but in both in both. 
country and in rock music, whenever you get up into the into the commercial part of it, where you're you're talking about money, then you're going to have less less honesty and more uh, aiming at whatever is commercial. And uh, I think you'll, uh, it's fortunate that we have people like Bob Dylan, you know, and uh, Bruce Springsteen who stick to their guns. Yeah. It's also, it seems like the artists that, you, that you've mentioned, you know, both on, on the country and, and certainly on the rock side, have been able to capture a certain blue collar and, and working man's mm -hmm. sensibility. Mm -hmm. That's real important. And maybe that is what American rock and roll is. Blue collar? I don't know. Mm. I don't, I don't either. But, but uh, I think uh, it's got a conscience, you know, and it's interested in, in, uh, in saying something. And speaking of conscience, let's, let's talk about, about something that certainly raised that a little bit last year, and that was Farm Aid. Mm -hmm. It seems that that, is, that was a really nice forum to show that rock and country are real closely related. It was a terrific atmosphere at the place. I wasn't there for the whole show because I was uh, working in Hawaii at the time. I just flew in and worked and flew back out. But, but while I was there, it was a terrific spirit. And, and that was exactly the feeling that I got. You know, uh, In fact, after that, we worked with uh, Neil Young and, uh, and had a great time uh, just because the, because the audiences were similar, you know. You could see that the same people that got off on, on the rock and roll, could get off on our type of whatever it is we play. <laughs> but there was a real submission of egos at the place, and everybody was just enjoying it, everybody else. And it looked great to see Arlo Guthrie up there again and uh, Foreigner. <laughs> what do you think it was about? What was in the air last year that made last year the year of the uh, of musicians? Uh, making a stand and, and saying something. I don't know, maybe the country just needed a spiritual revolution. God knows we weren't getting any help from the, any righteousness from politics. You know, uh, our, our foreign policy is, is, is shameful, you know. Uh, it's a good thing somebody in America showed some kind of compassion for other human beings. I don't think it, that, that our, our, our uh, government foreign policy demonstrated this in any instance, you know, whether it was in the Middle East or in Central America. And uh, I think it was one of the most positive things that's happened at this end of the century is this, is this sort of spontaneous feeling of compassion for other people and, uh, and uh, things that, that people like, like Bruce Springsteen are doing. It's uh, uh, when he does a tour and every show he gives uh, 10 grand or whatever he was giving to these different food banks and to, to uh, different charitable organizations on the way. It was so different from, from rock and roll when, when we grew up, you know, like uh, Elvis gave away some Cadillacs to some friends, you know, but I can't remember anything really. The, the best part of it is, is that he's such a, a great example to uh, people who love them, you know, that if they ever get in the same position, they'll probably do the same thing. Can music change things? I think it can. I hope it can. <laughs> I, I would, I would hope that there's stuff like, uh, like uh, Springsteen's doing, and uh, uh, I'm doing, and Dylan's doing, and Jackson Brown. You know, I would hope that it would make awareness of problems that that people uh, might not be aware of right now, like Central America and like uh, South Africa. And uh, you were talking about Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, that I think that record did a lot of good. Um, with, the, with the new stuff that you're writing now, and uh, is, it, is its political slant more what's happening in America or what's ha our foreign policy? Well, uh, the foreign policy is really just an extension of, of what, what we're desiring. I mean, we elected the people who are, who are uh, 
sending people into battle. And so we have to, to examine what our feelings are about these people and, and about, uh, about how we truly, feel. If, we're, if we're the symbol of liberty and justice for all, uh, are we going to live up to that in Central America? Are we going to allow self-determination of other nations? And uh, if we really believe in uh, freedom and self-determination, we'll uh, have to come to the, the decision that, that we have no business invading a smaller country or, or trying to impose our will on another country, be it in our hemisphere or in the Middle East. Hopefully, hopefully what we're seeing is, is we're seeing people waking up you know, coming out of a, somewhat of a dead sleep that I think that everyone seemed to have been in in the 70s. Well, things happen in cycles, sort of. Uh, you had a, a sort of a complacency in the 50s during the Eisenhower years and back in years when we still thought God was on our side and we were uh, remembering how the Marshall Plan rebuilt war-torn Europe and we're everybody's ally and everybody's friend and then things changed. And then... Uh, we had Vietnam and we had the assassinations of the Kennedys and of King and, and a lot of real terrible things that went down and, and confusion and, and people looked for stability after that, which happened in the 60s, that sort of cooled out into the apathetic 70s and uh, had the, the right wing sp swing of the pendulum now where we're, we seem to be in a more of a Rambo Red Dawn confrontational attitude toward the rest of the world. And, uh, and I hope that we're on the verge of a spiritual <laughs> revolution to where the people are going to, to have more of a spirit like, like Kennedy was talking about back in, his, in that American University speech where he was talking about how, how uh, Americans found communism repugnant as a philosophy, but that there were many things in the Russian people that we could hail in, in terms of personal courage, in terms of their contributions to art and culture and science, you know, and that they all, we all shared a common dream of leaving a world better for our children, you know. And uh, that's what I hope we're coming to. And I hope that like William Blake said, if the fool would persist in his folly, he'd become wise. And we've persisted in our folly so long that it's about time for us to get wise. Yeah. Maybe something like what happened in Libya can show us. I think one of the things that's happened recently that's touched me the most was uh, Vladimir Horowitz going back to Russia. <laughs> I mean, I, I cried like yeah. a baby. I mean, well, did you see the people in the audience over there crying too? <laughs> Just, you see people with just their heads in their hands and the beauty of the music. Well, music, I would love to go to, to uh, Russia. I, I want to take Willie over there, you know. Uh, I think I would, uh, I think there should be exchanges, you know, of uh, artists. I don't think that we have to accept any form of government, but there's uh, no form of government so repugnant that we can't find something in the in the people to admire you know and to 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 uh, communicate with hopefully we've we've one of the the good things about where we are is and and for as far as technology goes is that we've the media is so powerful today that you can you can actually now see Russian people mm -hmm. someone like me mm -hmm. can see how the mm -hmm. Russian audience is reacting to Horowitz and you mm -hmm. realize then Yes, they are people. So you're not just you just don't have mm -hmm. these, you know, these images of governments and figures. If you actually can see what a, a person, what kind of house he lives in, what he goes through every day. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's real important. Yeah, well, it's a great opportunity if it's used right. Mm -hmm. oh, sure. And uh, uh, I was a little disappointed in the media after this last uh, Libyan attack, where nobody, nobody questioned. The administration, or whether or nobody stood up and said, hey, "Hey, listen, is this right or wrong?" Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as they did back during Watergate. Mm -hmm. You know, there there was nobody standing up like Dan Rather used to get on Nixon all the time, and I, I was real disappointed about that. It was almost like everybody, everybody just bought it, 
And everybody in Congress was the same way at first, you know, everybody was supporting it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I can remember. Excuse me, oh. I'll have to cut there. Okay.